the wonderful love of Jesus. I had two young men and two young preachers in my office this past week, and what a testimony they are. It was a great joy to have Nikki Cruz and Sonny Argonzoni in my office. Nikki Cruz was the Mama gang leader, gave his heart to Christ. He'd been saved 30 years in preaching. He was the, uh, one of the key characters in the Cross and Switchblade uh, story. And Sonny Argonzoni was the first drug addict uh, we reached for the Lord when we came to New York City three years ago. Nicky was on his way to a crusade in London. He travels all over the world preaching to thousands, and I'll never forget how the love of Jesus touched him. I, every time I go past Fort Greene Projects here in Brooklyn, I get a lump in my throat. I was 115 pounds, 28 years old. But feeling the love of Jesus just rushing to me that Jesus had for drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. And I walked into this city and I uh, drove in rather 1957 green Chevrolet, slept in the car. I sure wouldn't do it now knowing what I know. But I slept in a car and put newspapers against the window. Found out the worst gang in New York City at that time. In fact, they, they had over, over uh, 300 gangs listed by youth department at that time, 1958. And I went down to, to find the Mile Miles. And they were staying against the fence in their red jackets with big double M's. 28 kids had been murdered in 1958 in gang fights. And I remember going up to one young man. His name was Israel the president of the gang, and he was very kind, shook hands, and uh, said, hey, preach, you're okay. I, he had listened to me preach for about five minutes. I went to shake hands with Nicky Cruz, and he spit on me, slapped my face, and said, go to hell. I'll never forget that stinging on my face. And I, all I could burn out, I, I don't think I did it in anger, Nicky, Jesus loves you, and walked away thinking, Lord, I know you love him, but I don't know if you can save him. He's the hardest. I don't like to be slapped. I don't like to be spit on. Nicky Cruz could get that out. It was like a stuck record, broken record. All night long, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He hated police. He hated everybody else. Some of you have heard his testimony. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And folks, to sit in my office and look at that young man on his way to London, having reached thousands and thousands around the world, five girls... Five children, I think uh, two or three in Bible school, and all called to some kind of ministry. Nikki going on with the Lord. All I could say is, Jesus, your love finds them. Your love is everlasting. Nikki never told me, never knew what the love of Jesus was and what Christ had done for him until his little girl, his first little child, came to hear him in one of his crusades, and he was telling the story of all the terrible things he did, went home, and she wouldn't talk to him. He said, what's the matter, honey? She said, you are a bad man. I don't want to talk to you. That's not my daddy. <laughs> and it hurt him. He didn't realize till then uh, how God had changed, how the love of Jesus had manifested itself so much in his life. Sonny Arkansas, I met 28 years or, or 30 years ago down in Brooklyn under the elevated train right off the Williamsburg Bridge. And I, I went up to him in front of a pizza shop. And I, he was a drug addict just waiting for his contact. Found out his name. I said, Sonny, Jesus loves you. He said, man, get off the block. My mom's one of those hallelujah people. And she's a, one of those tongue-talking hallelujahs. You sound like one. I said, yes, I am. But I, I remember saying, Sonny, Jesus sent me down here because he loves you. Sonny had been in and out of jail, in and out of prison. His mother would see him dirty, filthy, and ragged on the street and say, Sonny, please, just come home, change your shirt, let me give you a clean meal. He said, Mama, go home. Didn't want anything to do with, with family, had no thoughts of God, been shot at, in and out of prison. But I'll never forget the day. He came remembering that invitation to come to the center, remembering that, that, just that one statement, Nikki, or rather Sonny, Jesus loves you. His love will find you. And the love of Jesus found Sonny when he came in and heard Nikki preach at our center down here in Brooklyn. And he thought that, he thought Nikki, while he was preaching, someone had gone to him, told him all about him because Nikki was preaching his life. And Sonny sunk down in his seat because he heard his whole story being told. And Nicky Cruz goes over to Sonny, lays hands on him and said, God, save him and call him to preach. And Sonny thought, me, preach? 
a drug addict, a killer at heart. Oh, but folks, I set my office this past week. Sonny Argonzoni is not only a pastor, he's a bishop of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. They've got churches all over America. In fact, he was in Philadelphia helping set up another one of their churches. In their, in their conferences, they have three, 4,000, all of them converted drug addicts, alcoholics, prostitutes. Sonny Argonzoni is a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the love of Christ was manifested in him. Now see, there are many of you here tonight. You know what I'm talking about because up, up here you fellas from, drug, from, from the drug life, alcoholics. Many of you, not even in Teen Child, maybe other programs. Some of you here may be in business. You were a drug addict, you were an alcoholic, you were drinking, you were lost, you were hopeless. But the love of Jesus Christ came to you. Manifested itself to you. How, how beautiful wasn't it, the love of Jesus when you first heard of it? What a flush of glory when you realized that in spite of what you'd done, Jesus loved you. And you rejoiced in that love. You went a long time just basking in that love. And then you started going around telling everybody how Jesus loved them. Some of you have been witnessing. You've been saved five years, ten years. But what's happened since then? Many of you have backslidden about the love of Jesus for yourself. Somehow along the line, you, you, you got the idea... That because you have allowed a coldness or a failure into your life, that you can preach Jesus and his love to others, but you can't appropriate it to yourself. Now this is where I'm going with the message tonight. I want to talk about his love for you as a Christian. His love for you as a believer and for me. You know, I was preaching a number of years ago in Harlem in a street meeting, and I was going through a very difficult time in our ministry. Very, very difficult. Gwen had cancer. And in fact, I think this was her second cancer she had back in the hospital. And I had the burden of teen challenge and it was weighing heavy on me. Traveling, trying to raise funds. Trying to keep the whole thing afloat. And centers, cities all over the country calling. And, and I was absolutely at the end of my rope at this particular time. I, I, and in, in my burden and in my struggle over, I, I got so burdened over needs, I went down to about 115 pounds. Skin and bone, it just, there was no joy because I was so burdened down by the needs of the city. And in that, I, I shut Gwen out. And in her pain, she, she, she couldn't stand being cut out from my life. It, it wasn't that, I don't, I don't think I was a bad husband or anything, but I didn't really bring her into the burden that was on my heart. I should have shared it with her. And we were going through a rather difficult time. And I remember one day just losing my temper and going off for a street meeting. And I felt so dirty and so unclean. Has that ever happened to you? Where, you know, you want God with all your heart. You love him with everything that's in you. And, and you fast, you pray, you seek him, but suddenly, there it is, just like a flood. It just comes and hits you and sweeps you off your feet. You lose your temper, you do something stupid, and you feel dirty and unclean and filthy. And I had to go up into Harlem, and I'm standing there in my pain, and I'm preaching my heart out. Jesus loves you. I don't care what you did, drugs, alcohol, prostitute. Come on up, Jesus loves you. Give your heart to him. And after I preached this profound message, I thought, how Jesus could love anybody on the streets. I'm standing there after the meeting in despair watching drug addicts and alcoholics with our personal workers drinking in the love of Jesus. And suddenly, in my despair, my head down, feeling so low, the Holy Spirit said to me, David, why don't you appropriate some of that love you've been preaching for yourself? Why don't you let me love you? What gives you the idea that you can just preach it and not practice it, not appropriate it to yourself? And friends, from that day to this, there are many times I've had to just step back and say, Jesus, I've been out preaching it. I tell the whole world that you can save body, anybody from anything. Now, Jesus, come and love me. Amen. Love me. I remember one time when uh, one of Gwen's last uh, times in the hospital, she was so wiped out. She, she had uh, lupus, and had, had about 30 pounds of water on her and, and was in the hospital. 
And she, she had said, David, this is enough. I can't, after all these operations of cancer, this is just too much. And she went in the hospital just at the end of her rope. And I went to a hotel room near the hospital. And I said, oh, God, when does this ever stop? Lord, I love you. I see there's no, I can't figure it out. It, 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 she can't go through much more pain. And, you know, I said, Lord, give me something. And, you know, it's not a good idea to just say, Lord, give me something and open your Bible. Because you know where it fell? It fell in Jeremiah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know what you know, I did? I closed it and said, no, Lord, not today. I, I'm hurting enough. And you know what the Lord whispered in my heart? David, just lay still let me love you. So help me, the Holy Ghost brought Jesus his presence in that room, and he put his arms around me and began to love me. And I said, Jesus, now love Gwen. And, and then the Holy Spirit put a scripture, a Psalms, so and so and I went there. And you know what it said? He makes all wars to cease. I said, that's it. That's it. He's making all cease. I ran to the hospital. Gwen was dressed. He said, David, I'm healed. I'm getting out of here. Let's go home. I have victory. It was the love. The absolute love of Jesus Christ being manifested. The Bible said the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. You can't counsel other people that they, they are loved without appropriating that love for yourself. Now, there, there are some of you here that love Jesus dearly, but you're not persuaded that Jesus Christ loves you. You preach to others. You, you, you picture yourself, though, as... as having failed the Lord, and he's cast aside as a result of it. I want to speak directly to you tonight. I, I really believe God put this on my heart, and it's why I struggled so much with all the imps of hell to get through. But here's, I was laying on my face last night, and God began to speak clearly to me, to speak directly to those who be here tonight who felt that you've let the Lord down. You feel you've let the Lord down. You've not lived up to the standard you've heard preached in this pulpit or wherever it may be. Now, friends, if you've been coming to this church, we hold up a high standard. We preach a strong message of righteousness and holiness. And many of you feel that you can't live up to that, that you failed the Lord somehow. It's not that we've been putting a heavy trip on you. We're, we're trying to preach what we believe is the standard of the Word of God. But in your striving to be more like Jesus, you've failed the Lord. You've sinned somehow, and you sit here this, after, this evening with failure in your life. You have tripped, you have fallen. Satan has bruised your heel. Now remember, that's what the scriptures, in, in, it was originally said, that the serpent will bruise your heel. And when serpent bruises your heel, it does not mean you're damned or you're lost or outside of the love of Jesus. He's bruised your heel. But there's healing for that. But now you're here tonight and you're living with guilt and condemnation. You can't see how Christ can still love you because deep in your heart you know you may have grieved the Holy Spirit and you, you somehow walk right into the devil's trap or you're still in the satanic snare. But I want you to know, friends, and listen closely, you and I were reconciled to God when we were still enemies. When we were out in sin, not even thinking of God, Jesus loved us. Let me read it to you. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, yet sinners, we weren't even thinking of him. When you were out there, do you remember when you were out there? Do you remember when you had no time of, for him? Do you remember those days? And the Lord said, even then I loved you. Even then you were reconciled to me if you would have only repented and come. While you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Lord saying, if I loved you when you were out there not even thinking about me, do I not love you now when you're going through a struggle? When your heart still loves me? Now, I'm not talking about those who have just put God aside. They've given themselves over to their sin. They don't want anything to do with God. They're not interested in repentance. I'm talking about Christians and others who have backslidden somehow. In fact, the closer you get to Jesus, the least thing will seem big to you in the sight 
in your own eyes. You'll feel the grief of having grieved the Lord. Now, I don't have anything profound tonight, but I want to share you just a few things that the Holy Spirit's putting in my heart about His love. First of all, God wants us to be fully persuaded, fully persuaded that nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. I want you to go. Why don't you go to Romans 8? Why don't you go to Romans 8? The eighth chapter, verse 38. Beginning to read. Do you have it? Romans 8, 38. Oh, I love the word, don't you? For I am, this is Paul speaking, I am persuaded. I'm completely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Now that's the truth that the devil doesn't want us to be convinced of. He doesn't want you to hear that. He doesn't want you to know it. Because here, I want you to know something. If you can come, if you can get a hold of this truth, you can come through any trial. You can come through your temptation you're going through now in your trial. You can come through any failure and be more than a conqueror if you're fully persuaded that Jesus loves you. Look, look, look at verse 5. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? For it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You're conquered through the love of Jesus Christ for you. Look at me, folks. The cry of this book is be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to endure. Yeah. You may be able to stand in a troubled time, rooted and grounded in love. Yeah. I'm afraid we're not rooted, we're not grounded in the love of Jesus Christ. Many of us, we're afraid to appropriate it. Philippians 1, 6, don't turn, says, being confident of this, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perfect it to the day of Jesus Christ. When you came to the Lord, now listen closely to me, you came to the Lord. He decided he'd not let you go. Listen to me now. You came to the Lord, and it was known in heaven and hell and earth that Jesus paid for you with his own blood. And he put a stamp on you, and he engraved you in the palm of his hand, and he said, devil, this child belongs to me. Now, no matter what problem you're going through, no matter what failure you're at, if you'll confess it and repent, you'll come back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his love. You'll be drawn back by his precious love. He that's begun a good and work in you will perfect it through the day of Christ. You're not going to let the devil interrupt his work in you. Satan's lying to some of you right now. He's trying to tell you that Jesus has given up on you. He's telling you that Jesus is mad at you. That you're just wicked and evil, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be holy, you'll never be clean. You can hit, hear, hear Brother Bob preach, you can hear me, hear Gary, hear one of the pastors preach and say, oh, I'll never, I can't measure up. There's no way I'm going to measure up. Everybody else is measuring up, but I'm not measuring up. Have you ever sat here thinking you're the only one going through problems, only one having a problem? Anybody sitting here right now thinking you're the only one with failure in your life? You say, but what's, are you going to do it? Uh, one of those TV evangelist things on us? No, I'm not. I'm not standing here in any known failure in my life. But there are some of you sitting here now and the devil lying to you right now. He's saying, see, you tried and you can't make it. Bob did hit this so strong this morning. And here you sit wondering if you should even go on. We've had people leave this church. They have absolutely quit on the Lord because they say, I can't make it. I can't. I, I will never measure up to what he wants. I want you to know that God's given you a word. You can take it right to the devil and you can throw it right at him just as Jesus did in the wilderness and the devil's going to run. It's right there in the 8th chapter of Romans. Look at it. The 34th verse. 34th. Who is he that condemneth? Well, you know who that is, don't you? Were you condemned this afternoon before you came to church? Have you been sitting here doing the worship being condemned? We, we've got... We've got a Tom condemner who stands before the throne of God, accuser of the brethren, trying to accuse you, saying, you'll never make it. But who is this that condemneth? 
It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You stand right up against Satan. And you can say this with everything in you. I refuse your condemnation and your lies. Jesus paid for my sins. I repent. Jesus loves me. I, I'm on his mind right now. In fact, devil, right now when you're accusing me, he has me on his mind. He has me on his lips. He's talking to the Father about me right now. He's talking to the Father about me. This very moment, he's interceding before the Father. And you can tell the devil that. Glory be to God. And then you can quote him this scripture. I write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You go back to him. You say, Father, I've sinned. I've had four children and I never kicked them out because they failed me. I took them aside. Sometimes I had to take them to the woodshed. Sometimes I had to spank the meanness out of them. But all along they were my children and I loved them. And the only reason I spanked them was for their own good. When did Jesus throw you out? Tell me. When did he write a bill of a divorcement? Say, I divorce you. Go on out on your own. When did he do it? You can't tell me when he did that. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll go with you to the end. I'm going through you with your troubles. I'm going through your trial. Hold fast. Now, notice a very interesting verse, Romans 8.35. Look at it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, who is a person, isn't that? And you know who that is. That's Satan. But then look, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Now, those are things. That's not a who. Those are things. Who is it that brings these things on us? Satan himself trying to bring all these things to rob us of the love of God. But I notice, look down in verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Hallelujah. Now, to separate us, who shall separate us from the love of Jesus Christ? That word separation is to isolate. In other words, to make you feel like an island of rejection. That you're not loved. And I'll tell you what the devil does. He'll first try to strip you of love of those around you. He'll try to interfere in the love of your family. Interfere in the love of your friends. And try to isolate you. In fact, the separation means to put a great gulf between it and isolate it as an island. Some of you sitting here right now knowing what that means. You have felt rejection. You felt isolated. And you, 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 feel what, you feel just what they felt in Israel. It says, but Zion has said, the Lord hath forsaken us, and my Lord hath forsaken, forgotten me. Can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her own womb? Yea, they may forget Yet I'll not forget you. Behold, I've graven you on the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. And then in Hosea it says, I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Friends, God wants to heal every backslider here tonight. He wants to offer you his love and to heal that backsliding of your heart. Now, the Holy Spirit has really been putting me under conviction about the danger of presenting Jesus as a hard man. Do you remember that parable? There were three servants that were given talents. One was given ten, one was given five, and one was given one talent. And the man who had the one talent went and hid it in the earth. And one day the master comes and calls him to account. And he said, I, I want what I gave you. I want my return. And you know what he said? Master, I knew thee that thou art a hard man. And I was afraid. And I went and I hid my talent. And I was on my face before God. And the Lord was saying, David, there's something you're not hearing, you're not seeing yet. And I want to tell you, I don't believe you can be a holiness preacher of any kind. You can't be a preacher of righteousness unless you're teachable. And I'm telling you now, God's telling me I've got a lot to learn. And I confess it before you here now, and I'm not trying to be sentimental or put attention on myself. But God began to say, there's so much yet I've got to learn before I can be a shepherd to, this, to the sheep here even. All of us as pastors are, are open that God would teach us. But I got to thinking, Lord was showing me, what, what kind of teacher did this man have? The other two served the Lord with joy. 
They had no problem. They made their investment. It was a glorious experience. But this man comes and he said, boy, you're hard. And he was afraid and he hid his talent. Who was his teacher? What kind of message did he sit under that made him see Jesus as hard? Because Jesus is the master here. Brother Bob had to, he, he felt the same grief that I felt one time when, when some people that sat under his teaching had, had gone to a pastor and tried to correct him as if, you know, they knew it all now because they'd come into a holiness message. And Bob was alarmed and he got on the phone. He says, tell me, did my preaching produce that in you? And there was terror in Bob and in my own heart. Are, are, are we going to preach a message that would produce that kind of thing? Are they misjudging what is being said? And I got to thinking, Lord, what kind of a, a pastor, what kind of a teacher, what kind of a message was he sitting under that he perceives Jesus as a hard man? A Friday night, a young pastor met me back. I don't know if he's here tonight or not. And tears in his eyes, visiting from another state. And he said, Brother Dave, I've been preaching holiness in my church, and I preach it hard. And he said, the people are not receiving it, and they're leaving left and right. But I can't compromise on my message. And I felt pain in my heart, because all over the country now, there, there, there's a message of holiness coming forth. There's a message of righteousness. But folks, too many are preaching it as hardness. They're not presenting Jesus in fullness. I remember something Bob told me that changed my life. He said, David, when we preach holiness, we must never veil Christ. We must never veil the mercy of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, I don't want to be that hard man or, or, or that man that preaches a message that pictures Jesus only as a hard man because that produces fear and fear has torment and then people go and hide. Because they feel they can't make it. I don't want to be one of those preachers. You know, there are times when I, when I have to preach a strong message, a prophetic message especially. I know that there are some people that are out there that they're just, they, they want to say, yeah, preach it, Brother Dave. Get it. Hit it. Hit it. Hit it. It's almost like a cheering section. Hit it. And sometimes, Pastor, I know there have been times I've been carried up in it. I confessed to Bob today about a time down in Georgia. I was preaching at a camp meeting two years ago. And I, on that campground, I saw these great big satellite dishes. And you know my hatred for television. The superintendent of the movement there was great big, biggest dish I ever saw. And I'll tell you what, I got up there in that pulpit and boy, I skinned them alive. By the way, the Lord doesn't want hides. He wants souls, you know, skinning i tell you what, I thundered and I, uh, ever since I felt the pain for what I did. And later some pastors said, boy, you were hard, Brother Dave. But you know, there were some people in there just fed something in them. They wanted to hit it. They wanted hard, hard, hard. Now I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to compromise on my message. I'm going to preach it. But there have been evangelists, you know, that have preached a hard message and you were there watching either on television or something. Yeah, there. give it to them. That's right. And he's, they'll say, I'll not compromise. I'm going to preach and tell it like it is. But I've been hearing the Holy Spirit say to me, David, how are you presenting me to the sheep? Are you showing them my mercy and my love and my long suffering along with my hatred for sin? Are you making them afraid, so afraid that they'll hide? And I want the Lord to help me preach holiness stronger than I've ever preached it, but I want to preach it with brokenness. I want to be like Paul who said, I came to you like in the tenderness of a nurse. I'm going to read it to you. Paul said, but we were gentle among you. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted to you not the gospel of God only, but our also our very souls, because you were dear to us. I confess to you, I've never known that. I'm beginning to know it. I've never passed. I've been an evangelist. And I've thundered all over the world. I don't think I know what it's like to be a nurse, to look out over a congregation of people living in a wicked city, hurting, carrying all kinds of burdens and garbage from your past. And I, wanted, I want to see you walk in holiness. And all the past, we want to see you walk in holiness so much. 
Now, I, I can't speak for Bob. I know these men. Bob has a tender heart. Gary has a tender heart. I need this. I need to have that gentleness as a nurse, cherish of their children, not trying to spank them because there's a sickness, there's a disease, there's sin. And Paul is saying, I came to you people. My dear sheep is a nurse, cherishes her children. So being affectionate, desirous of you, we're willing to impart to you not just the gospel only, but our very souls because you're dear to us. Paul then added, we exhorted and we comforted and charged every one of you as a father to charge his children. No wonder Paul's message of holiness was received. It wasn't rejected. People didn't walk out here. Because he said, when you received this word of God, which you heard of us, you received it. Not as word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. I told this young preacher what I want to tell every preacher of righteousness and holiness in America. If you're going to be preaching a strong message, preach it through brokenness. Preach it through tears. And folks, that's what I've asked God to do for this pulpit. You may have heard people say, Times Square Church, you go down there and you just get beat. No, you don't get beat here. You won't get beaten here because God's breaking this ministry. He's breaking the hearts of the pastors, telling us that we need to be like Paul. We need to share with you as precious children, not trying to whip you, not trying to drive you, but to go to the throne of God Touch his righteousness. Touch his holiness. See a vision of Jesus so clear. And then come to you and say, here he is. In all of his love, he hates sin. And that's why we preach so strong about it. We feel his wrath against it. And we don't want you to be damned. We love you too much. But to do it as a nurse. To do it as a father with looking with love to his children. And I confess before a holy God I've not had that. I've not had that. But I want it. Make Jesus, present Jesus in his fullness. Sometimes we're like the man who was forgiven a great debt. And then we walk right out and choke somebody who's not living up to our standard. The Bible says of Jesus, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. That's Luke 6.35. Jesus is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father's also merciful. James said, the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Now God's showing me. He's just pounding in me with love. He, he'd been speaking all week to me, so strong. How serious this matter is of how we present Jesus to the world. How we present him. Paul said we are ambassadors for Christ. You know what that means? We represent him. The only thing the world's going to see of Jesus is what we show it. What we show the world of him. There, there's a, down in Brazil, I think it's in Brasilia, there's a cathedral, and there's a, a, one of those uh, glass windows, colored glass, leaded glass windows, and it's, it's, it's Jesus. You see all these people kneeling before him, and Jesus is standing with a great big club in his hand, ready to smite them. And that's their vision of Jesus. That's a perverted view of Jesus. And, and, and those people come there with that great fear of this man in heaven with a club over their head. God's word says he is very pitiful and of tender mercies. And he's saying if you're going to witness out in the street or you're going to counsel anybody, if you're going to talk to people about Jesus, you've got to be a faithful ambassador. You've got to represent me for my, who, who I really am. And what, what the word says, be, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. Be pitiful, be courteous. First Peter 3, 8. You know, much of the street preaching here in New York City is very discourteous. Very discourteous. It's confrontational. 
It's mean. Sometimes it's ugly. I, I, I would imagine we've got 10, 15 street preachers here tonight. But if you're a street preacher, or if you're a witness, or you are a counselor, you've got to understand what the Holy Spirit's saying tonight. Be careful. This is an awesome responsibility. How you present Jesus. Are you presenting him in his fullness? Or are you just showing one side of him? You know, uh, Steve and I were walking down 42nd Street a few weeks ago. And Steve was carrying a briefcase. And this street preacher, God bless his heart, up in the 42nd Street here in Broadway. He stopped. We, we, we just, I just stopped to listen. And he said, look at this. Two, me and Steve... Two computer junkies. They got their computer with them. They're so hooked on computers. You know what's in that box? A microphone. This microphone I have right here. With a big box that we carried in. Computer junkies. They're so wrapped up in the world. I mean, he scolded us. To hear that, dear brother, we were headed right down to hell. <laughs> Sliding right down on our computer. We, we were tempted to open the box. What, what, what are you telling them out there? You're shaking an accusing finger in their face. And this Lord who is very pitiful of tender mercies, are you making him out to be a monster? Are you? I don't want to misrepresent Jesus anymore. Be ye also pitiful. Be courteous. Now, look, the Bible said those who sin must be rebuked before all. That's 1 Timothy 5.20. The Bible said we are to exhort and rebuke with all authority, Titus 2.15. Unruly mouths must be stopped. You've got to rebuke them sharply, Titus 1.13. But we're also commanded to rebuke with all long-suffering. Now, that word long-suffering means very lenient, patient, and understanding. You know what the Scripture said? Street preachers, listen. Witnesses, listen. Counselors, listen. Preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means counsel, with all long-suffering. You're to do it, but you're to do it with pity, compassion, and long-suffering. Paul preached with that long-suffering. He said, I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long-suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know that you're a pattern of his long-suffering? Come on now, tell me it wasn't his long suffering that found you. How patient has he been with you? That, that's what God told me about television too. You know, last time I talked about television here, I did it with the tears in my eyes. I did it with a broken heart. And if I ever tell you again, God hates it, I'm going to tell it to you because I love you and I'm not trying to rail against you. But I, I've got to tell you right now, if it weren't for the long suffering of Jesus, I wouldn't be standing in this pulpit now. Folks, somewhere along the line, uh, I, I would have turned my back somehow, not on the Lord, but something would have crept in. My family would have been disintegrated and everything else, but for the long suffering. I stand here like Paul is a pattern of the patience and the long suffering of Jesus Christ. How long he bore with some of my foolishness. How long he put up with me. And yet he brought me back to this place and I stand now in his holy freedom. How patient he's been with you. Why will you not be patient with others then? Why will you not be patient with those that you deal with all around you? Now, truthfully, the love of Jesus never gives up on people. I want to show it to you, Revelation 3.15. Revelation 3.15. I'm not going to preach much longer. Revelation 3.15. You, you know this, he's talking about the Laodicean church. Don't you know that's the backslidden church? That's the harlot church? Look at verse... Revelation 3.15, the Lord is saying, And I know thy works, speaking the Laodicean church, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would you were either cold or hot. So then because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't know that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'd look this way for just a minute, if you will, please. You, you see... Jesus standing at the door. Well, if I, would you just look at verse 20. He's already told me he's going to spew them out of his mouth, hasn't he? 
Now look what he said. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen very closely to me now. It'd be easy. And I, I think there was a time in my ministry I could have stood in a pulpit and I, I, I would have said something like this. Look, there it is in black and white. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Folks, is it in your Bible? There it is. In black and white, I'll spew you out of my mouth. You're compromised, you're backslided, you're naked, you're cold, you're lost, you're undone. And God said, I'll spew you out of my mouth. And I had been preaching the truth halfway. Because look at verse 18. There's Jesus. He doesn't want them to be spewed out of his mouth. Look, he's counseled them. He said, please buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. He doesn't want them to be poor in spirit. And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. He's trying to cover their shame. He's not trying to expose anything. He's trying to cover it by his blood. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And for as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. He's offering mercy. He's offering grace. And see, if I had just come and preached, I'll spill you out of my mouth, I would have had scripture to prove it. But I would not have preached Jesus in his fullness. I would have missed. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Before I'll spill you out of my mouth, I'm going to knock on your door. Because I really don't want to spill my mouth. I want to sit down and eat with you. I don't want you standing naked before the world. I want you covered. But see, we give up on our weak brethren. If we're working with people and they fail us, especially after the second or the third time, it usually, I know it's, I've said it so many times. Look, I've tried. I can't waste any more time. He doesn't want God. He knows where I'm at if he wants the Lord. I'll be here, but I'm not going out of my way. I don't think you're going to make it anyhow. Have you said that about your husband or your wife? I don't know what it's going to take. I've prayed and I'm tired of praying. Man, I've done everything I know how to do. There's nothing left. And I mean, most people, do. we just give up on people. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't. I'm so glad Jesus didn't give up on Peter. Peter didn't deny him once. He didn't deny him twice. He, didn't, he denied him three times. He cursed him. He said, I don't even know the man. I don't know him. He told me Satan was after me to try to sift me. He warned me. I heard the word, I was warned, and yet even in spite of the word that I heard, I've been sitting under this kind of ministry, and I went right out and I did something to grieve my Lord. How could I have done it? Does that sound familiar? Come on. Amen. Don't hide. The Holy Spirit knows where you're at. Oh, but Peter, Peter remembers something Jesus said. And I can, Peter says, oh, the look in his eyes, I'll never forget that look. What was that look? It was a look of love. Because Jesus said, Peter, <laughs> i got to read it to you. Peter, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. You know what, Peter? You know what brought him back? I'm convinced of it. Peter's weeping over the hilltops. He's walking up and down the hillside of Judea and said, I've denied him. I've sinned. I've grieved the Lord. I shouldn't have done it. I'm his servant. I've preached his gospel. I've laid hands on the sick. I let him down. Oh, but he said something to me. He said he's going to pray for me. He's praying for me. He's praying for me right now. He's praying for me. Do you know that he's doing that right now for you? And for me, he's before the Father. He's praying for us just like he prayed for Peter. And then Peter remembers something else. Jesus said... I'm going to be converted. I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to be an example to my brothers. Strengthen your brothers. I'm going to be an example of his grace. Can't you say that right now to yourself and to the devil and the whole world? Yes, I've grieved him. I've sinned, but I hate it. I despise it. And I know he's interceding for me right now. And he's saying, you come back to me, and when you're converted, I'm going to make you stronger, and I'm going to use you. You're going to be a testimony to me and to your brothers. Hallelujah. 
What kind of love is that? I'm going to close in just a minute. You remember, you remember the prodigal son who just took his belongings and went off and he wound up in a pig pen eating the husk of the pigs? You ever been there? Far? Some of you are there. I, I have to close now, but this is where the Holy Spirit has brought me for tonight. Please hear me, and I don't... I'm not going to do it psychologically or sentimentally or anything else. But I ask the love of Jesus to make it real. Do you know that whole time that prodigal son was out there feeding the pigs? What was his father? His father was looking for him. Waiting for him. See, the Lord won't force himself on you. But he's waiting. All you have to do is like the prodigal son, come to the end of yourself. Say, look, I've had it. I can't carry this guilt, this condemnation. And more than that, my father has everything that I need. Do you know that father was praying for that son? According to the scripture, if you put everything else together, you, you see the picture, the composite picture. And one day he gets up and he comes back. And that's what God wants you to do tonight. You in the balcony here, down on the main floor, you have that burden on you. You've slipped away from the Lord. Your heart's grown cold. You're under condemnation and guilt. Lord said neither. Do. He, he told the woman, I don't condemn you. Go sin no more. Where are your accusers? He's not your accuser tonight. He's your savior. He's your savior. So this, this boy gets up and he heads back home. And before he even gets there, his father sees him and runs after him. You know, the, that's Jesus. That he comes after you, take one step to him, and I mean he'll come to you. The father didn't go up to him and says, you spent every, look at it, I told you it happened. I knew you'd do it. There was a streak in you, it's been there all the time. You're a brother, you're older brother, you ought to be like him. Stayed right here faithful. Well, that's not what he told him. What'd he do? He fell on his neck and kissed him. He saw his dirty clothes and he said to his servants, take those clothes, put new clothes on his back. Lord said, I'm going to make you a righteous person. I'm going to clean you up. The Lord's master said, take off those filthy shoes. He put new shoes on him. And the, the, the boy said, but I'm not worthy. Master, Father, I failed you. I've sinned against you. I've sinned against God. I'm not worthy. In other words, Lord, let me stay out here till I work my way in. I've got to earn your respect now. No, the Father said, right into the house. And he had a feast with him. Put on a feast. Why? Because the prodigal son could say, I've sinned against God, I've sinned against you, and I'm not worthy. And when you come to that place, then you come to the feast. He doesn't want you just camping outside. He wants you at his table tonight. Kill the fatted calf. and says, come on home. My son who is dead is alive again. Hallelujah. Some of you have been dead. God's going to resurrect you tonight. Hallelujah. Well, I told you, it's very simple. Per, bow your heads. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Show us your love tonight. How you're reaching out in love tonight to say, if you'll get up out of your despair, if you just get up out of your flesh, get up out of this thing that has a hold of you and come to me I'll receive you I'll make you righteous all you have to do is get up and come come home come home come home Lord Jesus I feel your love tonight for this people truly you love us you love us with an undying love Holy Spirit, just come and put your arms around the sinner here tonight. Put your arms around the backslider. Put your arms around those that are struggling with the weight, saying, I can't take it anymore. I, I'm bound by this thing and I want to be free and I don't know how to get free. Lord, put your arms around them and by your Spirit, just draw them. And tonight, break every chain that binds them and set them free. If God, by His Spirit, touched you tonight, and the Holy Spirit has said, this message is for you, and you've, you've been backslidden in heart, or you're carrying a load of sin or guilt or a habit, and you say, Brother, I want to come home. I've got to come. I need His love tonight. 
I'm tired of sin. I want to repent, but I want to be restored to His love. Let's all stand, please, so people can get out of the aisles. Jesus, uh, what a terrible thing to have a hard heart. And yet, Lord, I'm speaking to some tonight that are hard, some that are in the process of hardening. And yet there are some, Lord, that have open, tender hearts. And, and yet one day we'll have this hard heart that we're talking about and warning about tonight. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to come down upon me mightily. I'm asking you to, to give me clean hands and a pure heart. I want to deliver your heart. I want to deliver your mind. Speak into me and through me. And let everybody in this place uh, be warned, be touched. Oh God, I don't want a hard heart. I, I want to stand before you one day with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Don't let us ever lose that, oh God. As we see the making of this hard heart, may we be warned. And oh God, for those whose hearts are in the process of hardening, melt their hearts tonight. Don't let anybody walk out of here with a hard heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The making of a hard heart. There's nothing in my mind as beautiful and as wonderful as an open, receptive heart. I love to be around people that have openness, that they're just receptive to the Word of God. But there's nothing in my mind as sad as, sad as a hard-hearted person. What a tragedy to be around somebody whose heart is like a stone. It's rock hard. Now, some are hearing me right now that are developing this hard, unreachable heart. There are some in the balcony here on the main floor. You're almost at the point of being unreachable. And we'll explain that in just a bit. But how does a person, how, how does anybody, especially a backslidden Christian, develop a hard heart? Now, you can forget all about the psychologists and their pop psychology about why people get hard against religion because they say there's so many hypocrites, all kinds of excuses why people... See, uh, psychologists always blame somebody for your problem. And you can find somebody to blame, and uh, yet the Bible makes it very clear, very clear how the heart gets hard. I want you to go to Mark, the sixth chapter, and I'm going to show you a man who best exemplifies a man who had an open heart and closed it and became hard-hearted, a terrible, terrible tragedy. Mark, the sixth chapter. Let's begin reading at verse 7. I want to read this whole portion so that we can set a background. How a man or a woman develops a hard heart. It's all in this that I'm going to be reading to you, and we'll go through it. Mark 6, beginning to read verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for the journey, save a staff only, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet, for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil, many that were sick and healed them. Now listen to this, please. And King Herod heard of him, for his name was spread abroad. And he said, now folks, this is Resurrection Day, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead. He believed in the resurrection. And therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said, this is Elias. And others said that it's a prophet or as one of the prophets. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, it's John, whom I beheaded, he's risen from the dead. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, it's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias 
had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. All right, look this way, please. There was a tremendous commotion out in the Judean wilderness, out by the Jordan River. Multitudes from Jerusalem and all over Judea were going out to hear a very strange-looking man. This man had been living in the desert, and you, you could be sure he had not shaven, he had long hair, he had a beard, he had a coat of camel's hair, he had a leather girdle on him, and when they offered him food, their food from the city, when he offered them their sweet breads and their desserts, he turned it down, and he turned aside and had his own little meal of locust. He ate locust and wild honey. He ate bugs. Strange man, according to the crowd. But they were flocking out to hear a man sent from God, a man who called himself only a voice, and that voice was the most piercing voice that had ever appeared on the scene in Judea or in on the earth at that time. And they were flocking out. They loved to hear him scathe the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He came out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they would stand in the periphery of the crowd and he'd point his rod at them and call them a brood of snakes, a brood of vipers. He said, just a pack of snakes. And the crowd loved it. But they repented because his message pierced into their hearts. Soldiers came to hear him. And, and they would say, what can we do to be saved? Because his message pierced their hearts. And he said, uh, be satisfied with your wages. And I'm sure King Herod loved to hear him preach to his army, be satisfied with your wages. He was, he was scathing to all against sin. He was fearless. He feared no man. And Herod heard about this man, John. And I'm, I'm sure being the leader, being the king, he traveled with quite an entourage. I would always picture, uh, I've always pictured that scene. I've got a vivid imagination. I picture about six black chariots. And, and I see horsemen everywhere, his bodyguards, and I see them coming, standing. Uh, he parks his, his uh, chariots on the hillside. He's heard about this man. Now, I, I have a feeling in my heart that Herod had grown cynical. He, he had administered uh, government to the Jews, and I'm sure he was tired of the phony priest he, uh, of that day. He was tired of the Pharisees who made long prayers and yet robbed widows' houses. He saw the hypocrisy. He, he heard their crazy messages. He saw infighting among the different religious sects. And I'm sure he was cynical. He was saying, religion has nothing to do for me. And he, he, he went out of curiosity. Because uh, that's where many of you are here right now. Many of you have heard a cynical, you're cynical in, in a measure because you've heard and seen nothing in religion but that which is hypocrisy. You have judged all religion by certain television ministries that are into materialism or preach a money gospel and you've called them money grubbers. Some of you sitting here now, you have never really seen reality. You've never heard it. All you've seen of religion is that which has bored you and caused you to be cynical. But he came out of curiosity to hear this prophet John. And I'm telling you, when he heard him, something happened in Herod's heart. He said, this is a different man. He is a holy man. He's a godly man. This man is telling the truth. This man, the Bible said he gladly heard him, and he did many things. He kept coming back to hear John, and the harder John preached, the more he loved it. In fact, one day, he came to hear John the Baptist, and he's sitting there. I don't know if Herodias is there or not, but he had stolen his brother Philip's wife, and he's living in adultery. And in that society among the Jews, that's the worst thing he could have done. Unforgivable sin. And John the Baptist points a finger at him, right at the king. And he says, King Herod, it's not lawful for you to have that woman. Give her up and do what is right. Repent. And Herod loved it. He loved it. I can picture him going back and telling his prime ministers and, and his cohorts, 
There's a man of God. That's what I like to hear. I like to hear a man tell it right. That man's not into materialism. That man doesn't care about clothes. That man's a real preacher. We're going back. You know, a lot of people like that. They, they finally hear a sound. And they know it's not phony. And they know the man or the men that preach it are living it. Because men who live their message, you can't mistake it if you have discernment in your heart. You can't mistake it. And he hears a sound. And he loves that straight preaching. And he loves this man. In fact, the Bible said he defended him. He would let nobody touch this man. That's my man. That's my preacher. I'm sure he went up and down the halls of his palace saying, tomorrow we're going down the wilderness again. I've got to hear another hot message from Brother John. And I'm sure he told everybody. I'm sure he got up before his court and said, I want everybody there tomorrow. You've got to hear this man. He is something else. He tells it like it should be. That's the way preachers should be. That's the way churches should be. Like John the Baptist. And he comes to hear John the Baptist and the Bible said he hears him gladly. I'm going to tell you, folks, I'm preaching tonight the same message John the Baptist preaches. Re- preach repentance. And I'm going to preach it straight. And we preach straight from this pulpit. You know, we have a lot of people that come to this church and they sit here. They've, they've heard all kinds of phony stuff. They've come from churches that have bored them. And they come and they say, boy, they tell it straight. I like it. I've had them hug me and say, boy, you preach it straight, Brother Dave. Don't stop preaching it straight. And I know they're still living like the devil. <laughs> I've been comp, I have been comp, lamented. More on my preaching by sinners than Christians. You know, I'm not looking for your compliments, by the way. And I'll tell you what, the more I preach straight, the less it'll be complimented. But he, he is so taken by this man. He makes moral changes in his life. He does a lot of changes. He goes home and he thinks it over and he says, I, I can't do that anymore. I can't do that anymore. He, he's laying down this and he's laying down that. He hears him and he makes moral changes in his life. Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and he observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and he heard him gladly. Gladly he heard him. Uh, there are some of you here tonight, you don't have a hard heart. You gladly hear the word because there's a hunger. This man had a hunger in his heart. He couldn't have come unless there was something in him that really wanted reality. This is the tragedy. This is where hard-heartedness starts. With many people who start with a hungry heart, they really want reality. They really want to do what is right. They don't want to, they don't want to live in their sin. They don't want the misery anymore. They want they really want to change. And I believe Herod wanted to change. But you see, Herod could not give up a fatal attraction in his heart. He, he was totally ensnared by this woman Herodias. He had stolen his brother Philip's wife. He is an adulterer. He's living in adultery. And John said, you can't repent until you bring forth uh, works me to repentance. In other words, you've got to do what God says. You've got to do right. You've got to lay your sin down. And he he is convicted by this message. And uh, Herod knows this woman. He knows she's a murderess. She's a conniving, revengeful woman. And he knows it. There's no way he can get around this manipulating, conniving, murderous woman. No doubt she's intelligent. She may have been beautiful. She may have been charming. But she was a snake. And and Herod knew it. All around Herod, uh, uh, he sees men repenting at John's message. He sees people changing. He sees uh, people making restitution. He sees soldiers no longer complaining. He sees Pharisees. He sees publicans paying back over uh, uh, 
uh, collected taxes. He sees people that have stolen things, making restitution. And here he is. He's being challenged now. If you want to repent, if you want life, lay down your besetting sin. Lay down your pet idol. Lay it down. But Herod really would have loved to repent if he could have given up everything but Herodias. John, there's no evidence that he ever went to John alone and said, look, John, I respect you. I know you're a holy man, and I've got a problem. I am hooked on this woman. I hear your message, and I would really like to be free. Could you tell me how to get free? You see, there are people sitting here right now. You would love to repent. You would love to serve Jesus and come to this church even perhaps faithfully. You'd like to be a part of the body of Christ. But there came a time, and there's a time just now about to ripen for you, where the Holy Ghost says, if you're going to repent, you've got to lay down that besetting sin. You've got to lay down that fatal attraction. You've got to lay it down now, tonight. And Herod, there's no evidence that he went to John. John could have told him, why, there's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy of latch, and he is coming to open every prison door. He is coming to break every chain. And if you'll repent, he's already here in spirit, and he will give you, he, he will give you freedom. He will break it. There could have been a break. He could have been helped. Some of you sitting here now, you can't come to Jesus because of a fatal attraction in your heart. Now, what is it or who is it that's holding you back from repenting and following Jesus with all your heart? I, I've got to speak what I believe the Holy Ghost has put on my heart tonight. There are some of you, a number of you here tonight. You have backslidden over this. You are not serving God because of it. Let's talk first to young women Middle-aged women, I don't know what age you may be. Let's talk to the ladies first. You cannot make a surrender. You cannot repent because you have a heart that's given over to somebody. There's a man in your life, and that man is evil. That man is corrupt. That man is going to destroy you. And deep in your heart, you know what he's like. You know it in your heart. And the Holy Ghost has dealt with you. You know that that man, you do things and say things with him that you wouldn't do under any other circumstances. You do it and say it only when you're with him. You know there's something evil. You know there's a serpent in it. But it has your heart and you can't lay it down. There are men here right now. There's some woman in your life that has captured your soul and your mind. And you can't eat, you can't sleep, it's consuming you. You want Jesus, you don't want to go to hell. You'd like to be a Christian, you'd like to repent, but you can't stay away from that serpent woman. She has your heart. She makes you say and do things you would not think of doing at one time. It's there, it has your heart. That's the beginning of a hard heart. Herod turns away from John's preaching because he knows if he repents, he's got to lay it down. Now, let me tell you something and listen closely. The Lord, by his spirit, is, is not wanting you to lay down your adultery, your, your drugs, your alcohol, these besetting sins, simply because he's mad at you for doing them. It's, it's not because your sin angers. He's already paid the price for sin. He died for all sin. The reason he wants you to lay it down is because he knows the snake in it. He knows the viper in it. He knows the poison in it. He knows it will kill you. He knows it will destroy you. It's because he loves you. Then he said, lay it down or it'll kill you. It'll give you a hard heart and you'll turn against me. It's not, it's not just Adultery. It's not fornication. It's not. It's the fact that it has your heart. It's an idol. And it has you in its grip. It's ensnared you. And he goes back. The Bible said, a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Shall be destroyed. He 
John could have helped this man. You know, if you'll come to Jesus with your fatal attraction, if you'll come to Jesus with that, that, that bosom sin that holds you so tight, if you'll come bold, you just come as a child to Jesus, you say, oh, Jesus, this has overwhelmed me, this has overpowered me, and I've got to have help. You come with an open heart. You come ready to lay your sin down, even though it's got a hold of you. You come to him, and I promise you the Holy Spirit will lead you through. It may take a little time, but God will bring you through. He'll break every chain. He will break those chains. He has all the power. You say, if I come to Jesus, I've tried. I've made promises, and I can't break it. I keep going back. Because you have not yet trusted the Holy Spirit. You have not yet understood how much he wants to deliver you. There is deliverance. Hallelujah. You have to have the want to. You have to have the desire. So, God, I want to be free. I promise you, you can be free. There is not a sin. There is not a sin out of hell that can't be broken. There is not a single fatal attraction that cannot be smashed by the power of God through the Holy Ghost. If we, by His Spirit, mortify the flesh, we shall live. Through His Spirit, we kill the flesh. The trouble is, you've been fighting it yourself and making promises, and what you wind up is sin, confess, sin, confess, sin, confess. And it doesn't work, and you get discouraged, and you go out and say, what's the use? I don't want, watch what happens now when, when, when you go to your idol, because if you go to your idol, you become just like it. Whatever spirits in the idol will leap upon you. And I want to show you those, those who go back to their lust or their fatal attraction are soon driven into a deep, wicked, destructive, downward spiral. You, you Listen to me, please. You've got to hear this. It's not a matter of saying, well, I'm just going to go my way. I'm just going to do my little thing. I've, I've got one thing I can't let go. And I'm, I'm just, someday I'll be free. But you see, the devil never going to be satisfied to let you just go out and do your thing with your one little particular sin. He's not going to be satisfied at all because he's going to make sure that he drives you down deeper and deeper into sin so that you will never want to come back. He has to harden your heart lest you once again gladly receive him like Herod did. He has to take that gladness toward the gospel out of your heart. And the only way he can do that is to drive you deeper and deeper into wickedness, filth, and vileness. He will drive you. And folks, I have seen that all the years of my preaching. Those who've sat under the gospel of repentance like Herod and then turns away, goes to the idol, goes to the attraction, and says, well, I, I, I just can't give this up. Go follow the attraction. Go follow the lust. And folks, what a terrible thing begins to happen to this man now. He begins to close the gospel off. You don't find him anymore going out to hear John preach. You find him now becoming more and more like his idol. He becomes more and more like Herodias. And he's being driven. And it's not very long. Folks, it's just a very short time. A very short time. Just a matter of months before this man loses all his senses. And finally, for a song and a dance... A song and a dance, this man sells out a godly man, kills him, and decapitates his head. Takes his head off. You watch this man hardening his heart now. He's driven to do something he never thought he would ever do as long as he lived. It's so uncivilized. It's so vile. It's so unthinkable that he could lose all his reason and act like an animal and sell out this man that he knew to be a man of God, so holy and so righteous, and, and chop off his head and sit there at a party and watch them bring the head of John the Baptist in on a tray. And present it to Herodias. 
And I believe that woman was wicked enough to have that head bronzed and put in her bedroom. On her dresser. Such a wicked, vile woman. You say, preacher, I'm Pastor Wilson. I'm, I'm not a preacher killer. I, I am not going down into degradation. I may have a problem, but I may have a besetting sin, but I'm never going to go down into that spiral, go worse and worse. Oh, that's not what Romans says. Romans, the first chapter. You'll see this spiral of sin that goes down to the very pits of hell. First chapter of Romans. I'm just going to read a few verses, 18 and 19. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is shown to them or manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Verse 21, because that when they knew God, you see, they, they heard the preaching. They knew what was right and wrong. They glorified him not as God. In other words, they stayed to their idols. Neither were they thankful, but they became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now I want you to go down at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now let, look at me for just a minute. A reprobate mind is, is a mind that is no longer open. It's a closed mind. It's absolutely closed. And when the mind is closed to the gospel, that which could be known of God was clearly known, but they refused to retain it. They refused to heed the gospel. Therefore, God gave them over to a closed mind. And now look what's happening. We look at this spiral down into hell, doing those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Folks, that's, that's, these sins are pasted right on the gate of hell. These are sins right out of hell. It, it, it's, these are steps leading right to the pit. And the worst of all, verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, here's what happened to Herod. Herod now is doing exactly what Herodias was doing and having pleasure in it. He was just like his idol. He had become the idol. No, oh, folks, the day will come when, when right now you, you walk out the streets here and you see some of the stuff that goes on. You go in the subway, you go on the job, you walk some of these filthy streets of immorality and you see what some people are capable of. You read about it, you hear about it. And, and at one time you would have scratched your head and said, how can anybody do that? And then in short time, you're doing exactly everything you've heard of, every sin that's named. You are going to be guilty of it because you have now a closed mind and you're following after your lust. You have been given over to your idolatry till finally you not only do what they're doing, but you enjoy seeing others do the same thing. You take pleasure in that kind of wickedness where once you could have walked into a bar room and run out because the Holy Ghost was pulling you. Now you go in, you're one of them, you're a part of it. Now those secret things that you only once dreaded and said, how can any human being do it? And then suddenly you're doing it and having pleasure with others who do the same things. That's all that he's talking about here. What a tragedy. Tragedy. You may not believe it. And it won't be long till you'll be capable of the most unthinkable sins. Who would have ever thought that a man who sat there praising this man, obeying this man, glad to receive him, would turn aside one day and said, chop his head, and walk away and become like Romans 1. Who would have ever believed it? It's the hardening process. Who would have ever believed? 
uh, a preacher's wife, three precious children, who one time would rather die than give up one of her children. But she falls into an adulterous affair, falls in love with a young man half her age, runs off, leaves her kids. Her heart's hard. She never, if you'd have told her five years before, one day you're going to run off, leave all your children, leave the ministry, and you're going to wind up drinking and going to bars, she would have laughed at you. But no, downward spiral. She cut off everything and turned to her idol. Who would have ever thought a young woman could uh, drive her car into a lake because she's in love with a young man who says he doesn't want anything to do with kids. And she's got two. What happens to a woman? What kind of a downward spiral brought her to this place where she can just sit on the edge of the lake and watch as her car slowly sinks and her two boys screaming and drowning? What kind of a downward spiral? What kind of hardness happens? What kind of hardness? And you know, they tell us that that young woman at one time played with those children. They were so sweet and she seemed to love them so much. An idol. She became just like her idol. Hardness set in. Anything goes when that hardness comes. Anything. Now those who come to this point become haunted. Haunted. Absolutely haunted. There's nobody more haunted than a backslider. I mean, they're the most haunted people in the world. Every time they can walk down the street, they hear a trumpet. They come to, you know, the trump of the Lord is sounded. They come to attention. There's, a, there's another rumor that comes to Herod. said, there's, a, there's another man. And he's... He's raising the dead. Lepers are being healed. Blind eyes open. Deaf ears unstopped. He said, I know who he is. I know exactly who he is. Well, his name is Jesus. No, it's not Jesus. It's John. He's raised from the dead. He's come to hunt me. And his, his friends and his guards said, no, no, it's, it's Elias, prophet. It's Elijah raised from the dead. Or one of the prophets or someone like a prophet. They're trying to quiet him down. He said, I don't care who you said it is. It's John. Man can't sleep. He can't eat. He's haunted. He's, he knows he's turned down the gospel of repentance. He knows he's killed a holy man of God. And I'll tell you, every time you walk out on a Holy Ghost message, you crucify Jesus afresh. But it's Elijah, Herod. No, it's John. And I'll tell you, from that time on, all through Jesus' ministry, he is wanting to meet this man. Now, you know that Pilate finally brought him to him and he had a face-and-face encounter. This man believes in resurrection. Here's a man who believes in miracles. He still has this. I I believe in miracles because later he's going to ask Jesus to perform a miracle for him. When he has him face to face. And, And he keeps believing that a holy man can be raised from the dead. He believes in resurrection power. Isn't that amazing that people can live in the depths of sin when they backslide? They can still believe. There are, there are some of you here now. You have turned your back on the Lord. You're deep in your sin. You're going downhill, doing things now you never thought you could ever do. But, but if anybody dare ask you, you can be in a bar, you can be drunk and still talk about Jesus dying on the cross. You know all about it. You still believe that Jesus died for sin, that he is resurrected from the dead. That he was a man who could heal. You know all about him. You could probably teach in a Bible college for two hours. How do you sleep? You, you know, every time, the New York Times, the past two weeks, been talking about everybody in the country talking about angels appearing everywhere. Life magazine, the front page, angels appearing. They're talking about angels appearing in the heavens and everywhere. Have you heard about it? Angels everywhere. What do backsliders who once knew the power of God think when the worst sinners and liberals are talking about angels? 
What, what do they say now when the scientists watching television and now they say all these weather changes, there's something cataclysmic, there's something supernatural going on, and many scientists say we're destroying our planet, it's soon going to be all over. And that Christian in the backslidden there says, I know what that's all about. That's, that's John. He's raising the dead. I've been, that's a gospel. <laughs> the Holy Ghost is the hound of heaven. He'll hound you because he loves you. He'll hound you. Oh, boy, does he hound. I'm thanking, I'm glad he, he hounded me. He'll hound you to your last moment. He'll stay right with you. I don't care who it is. The Holy Ghost, the hound of heaven will stay right there. Finally, Herod types end up mocking and laughing at very God himself. Because Jesus was God in flesh. Would you go to Luke 23 with me, please? We're going to see him coming face to face, finally, with his nightmare. Can you imagine this man living three years with this uh, nightmare, this haunting? 23rd chapter, verse 3, beginning to read. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest it. Then said Pilate to the chief priest and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And when they were... And they, and they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. Isn't that amazing? After about three years now, Herod's finally going to meet him face to face, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. And when Herod saw Jesus... He was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Now look this way, please. I know exactly how that went. Jesus walks in, and Herod's looking at him. Looks him over, and he's thinking, his eyes aren't the same. He's a little taller. And he speaks with a different voice. But that's John. That's John. And you know what he said? Come on now, I know they call you Jesus, but you're John, aren't you? You're John. Tell me you're John. This man's still haunted. You're John the Baptist. You've been raised from the dead. What do you want out of me? I can't sleep. I can't eat. What do you want? There's not a sound. This this man says, I know exactly who you are. You are John the Baptist. I cut off your head, and I'm thinking he's looking for a scar. I believe he got as close as he could to walk around him and see if there was any mark for the sword. and chopped off his head. You know what the Bible says? Here's the tragedy of the hard heart. And Jesus answered him, not a word. There's no greater judgment than for God to stop talking to you. There's no greater judgment on earth. Saul knew what that was all about. He came under that judgment because he followed the sin of his own heart. His pride took him away from the repentance. The scripture said, When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. He finally ends up trying to consult with the witch. You know what he tells this witch? He said, God has departed from me, and he answers me no more, neither by prophets, nor by dreams. He said, I don't hear from God anymore. I can't think of anything more tragic, it causes me to tremble that a person can become so hard in their heart 
and the Lord sees that nothing is going to move it, that he doesn't talk anymore. And it ends up that you can sit in a meeting like this, no movement of the Holy Ghost, no amount of conviction. If an angel came down in bodily form and preached directly from the throne of God, it would not touch. No tragedy can move the heart. There's nothing. The heart is absolutely untouchable. In fact, every question to God, every inquiry now is met by an emptiness. There's no answer. There's no response. Oh, my brother, sister, that is one thing. I would rather be dead now than that that should ever happen to me because, oh, if I did not have the comfort of the Holy Spirit inside that voice, that inner voice of the Holy Ghost. You're my beloved son. I love you. And to get his direction and to know the, 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 the witness of the Holy Spirit that the Christian has. Christian, if you didn't have the witness of the Holy Ghost, you would be in terror. If you didn't have the voice, you hear him. You, you heard him today. You're hearing him now while I preach. The majority of you who love the Lord, you're hearing him in the inner man right now. It's not my preaching that's comforting you. It's the Holy Ghost in you that's comforting you. You hear his voice. You know his mind. He speaks to you. He convicts you of sin, of judgment and righteousness. He's in you. He's at work. God help those who backslide, those who follow their idols, and they can sit in any church any kind of revival meeting, any kind of moving of the Holy Spirit, no conviction, absolutely, totally dead. And Jesus, see, he answers Pilate. Pilate's not quite hard-hearted, I guess. The Herod, who had once received him gladly, and you know what happens next? The man who received Jesus gladly in mockery, puts a royal robe on his back. And he starts laughing at him. He said, King of the Jews. And he begins to laugh at him. And he joins the soldiers in mocking this blessed Lord. And the chief priest and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod with his men of war set him at naught. Means they began to belittle him and they mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. And that's something that you can one time have heard the gospel with gladness and then up end up sitting in the church snickering at the preaching. You can end up sitting there. What a bunch of crazies. What a foolish thing to think that at one time I believed that garbage. What a bunch of unintelligent people. Let's get out of here and end up mocking the Son of God. And folks, I tell you, the greatest mockers of the cross of Jesus Christ are those who, like Herod, at one time, gladly received the gospel. And they become mockers and scoffers. In closing, I have a dear friend who had to endure a horrible tragedy just recently. His father in the 80s, his stepmother dying of cancer. <clears throat> and they called in one of these suicide doctors for a double suicide. And... Uh, in fact, they even called, the newspapers came in on it. It was rather well publicized. And this dear man, dear friend of mine, had to listen to his father when he begged him one last time, please, please. He'd witness to him and witness to him. Just before the man's about to go into eternity, through an assisted suicide with a lethal injection, turns to his son and says, get away with your garbage. I don't want to hear your Jesus. 
I don't want to hear anything of that. That's for money-grubbing preachers. The words to that effect, I want nothing to do with it. Hard. Broke his son's heart. This broke him. This man and his wife go out in eternity hard like a rock. How are you going to go out? How are you going to face Jesus at the judgment day? You think that hardness is going to stand before the throne? You think that hardness is going to stand? No, because said every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every eye shall behold him. Where are you at? In what stage are you in this process of hardening? Is there still time? Let me tell you when you could know if there's time. If you sense a stirring in your heart right now, there's something still moving. That's the Holy Spirit. He's still able to penetrate. He's penetrated those walls that you're already erecting. He, maybe he came in through a window, came in through a door that's cracked. The Holy Spirit's there. He's witnessing to you. He's saying, don't turn me away. That's why he stands at the door and knocks, because he knows somebody's about.